Well, hello and welcome to the Dividend Cafe, but also to the Fiscal Feminist Podcast. And if I don't sound like Fiscal Feminist Podcast hostess Kimberly Davis, it's because she's sitting right across from me right now. And we are doing a special edition of merging our two podcasts. Should we call it the Dividend Feminist? That's a, I like that, actually. <laughs> I like it, too. Yeah, it's better than Fiscal Cafe. Um but like we're it. yeah we're we're mixing our uh, we're kind of combining our efforts here this week because we have not done this yet we thought it would be sort of fun and and we wanted to bring together uh, a little bit of the investment talk we do at Divin Cafe and a lot of the the things that Kimberly's doing with Fiscal Feminist and so we hope you'll uh, enjoy what we have to say Kimberly how are you doing. I'm great, David. I'm very excited to do this with you today. Um, There are a couple of things that have been rolling around in my mind that I've wanted to talk to you about. So this is a perfect occasion to share with my readership uh, some of your insights. I don't want to give uh, people the impression that the way that folks on the team have to get with me is by with a headset on and a (laughs) microphone in front of us. We do talk throughout the entire day as well. But no, this kind of conversation that we have for our clients and and people to listen to, I think will be really engaging. Start off for those who are not as familiar yet with Fiscal Feminist, which is obviously a newer brand and a newer platform that you're building out. Um, And it's obviously really developed an audience and and an interest. But for those that um, are used to hearing Dividend Cafe, maybe give a kind of overview of what the Fiscal Feminist is. So I um, started the Fiscal Feminist Platform because I have this mission to try to enlighten women and empower women to take control of their financial futures. Um, And and I mean all women, not just, uh, you know, high-end investor type uh, people, but everybody. I think women have not been comfortable in the money conversation for a long time. It's just a, a... an element of history, really. I think women have not had those discussions early on in life where they are comfortable talking about money and taking responsibility for it. And we've evolved over the years. So with more and more women in the workforce, um, you know, starting their own businesses and just becoming more engaged with money, they need to have the tools to understand how to work with that and become more effective in their own lives. With control of your money, you take control of your life, your mental happiness, your physicality. You know, money influences so many aspects of our lives. And if we are in financial turmoil, that can cause us a lot of um, upset in our general life. So that's my mission. We talk about a variety of topics. Um, It can be anything from what to do before you get married, uh, cybersecurity, um, being part of the sandwich generation I wrote about. That's being, you know, in charge of a family of your own and also having to take care of parents and perhaps also have to work and understanding that there is a conversation you might have to have with your elderly parents so that you can help them and maybe, you know, help them if you need to provide for them as well because our parents are living a lot older than they, you know, they're much older than they used to be and this is a whole new problem that people didn't have to deal with before. So I do think there are some things that are unique to women um, in the financial realm Although a lot of the knowledge that we put out there could be used by anybody. Mm. But it's just to try to elevate a level of consciousness with women that it's okay to talk about money. It's not a, to- it's not a scary topic. Um, with certain tools, it's easy to manage. Well, easy. It's, it's manageable mm-hmm. as long as you know what they are. Well, it, it, it occurs to me there's three examples that you've brought up of uh, some of the things you've addressed already with Fiscal Feminist in your writing and in podcast. The uh, initial uh, issue that we ever released where you kind of announced the Fiscal Feminist Platform was heavily bi- autobiographical from, from you around the fact that you uh, were a, a professional woman and left the workforce and had children, went through a divorce later in life, found yourself with a lot of financial ambiguity, and now you've made it a mission to bring financial clarity and 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 I think it's fair to say that even though there could be men in that situation, it's certainly in our culture more common. It might be women, either from a divorce or death, mm-hmm. that may be in that position. But then even the other two, the sandwich generation, you have. Uh, let's see, your daughters are in all in their twenties. All, all in their twenties. 
your oldest one must be getting close to. She's twenty eight. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then and then both your parents still living. Yes. In Pittsburgh, go Steelers. Juju yeah. Smith doing great. Yes. Preseason, Big, I might add. Well, you know this. The last year, it, it can only get up. <laughs> it can only move up from last year. But um, now dealing with ailing parents a later stage in life. So sandwich generation that you're in. Uh, was a, another autobiographical. Yes. And I'm, and I'm really sad to say, and of course this kind of touched all of us at Bonson Group, another autobiographical issue around the cybersecurity thing and you being the victim of not just identity theft, but a vicious cyber, digital, financial theft scenario here very recently. Um, hopefully we run out of things that you have to cover. <laughs> well, you just have to look at it. There's always a silver lining in something yeah. bad that happens to me. Yeah. So, um, but on the, the topic, just quickly about, um, you know, I was a professional woman. I was a lawyer. I was a corporate lawyer. I was an investment banker. I was a CFO. And when I went through this so-called gray divorce, um, a lot of... Wait, maybe say what a gray divorce is. So a gray divorce is basically a divorce that occurs anytime over 50 and a lot of women who are involved in those divorces really end up kind of on the wrong end of the stick. Yeah. Um, so I was not I was someone who, in theory, had the knowledge to kind of keep my eye on the ball. But as my family obligations and then I tried to do a little bit of work on the side kind of grew, I just stopped watching a lot of things that were going on. And I was really uh, involved in a just a really bad situation that I had to come to grips with as did my children because our standard of living and they were all in college and whatnot. So there are a lot of obligations that I had to fulfill and it was a tricky equation. So I think uh, just having women be a little bit more aware and ask right questions, not be afraid to ask questions, not feel like they're, you know, uh, not being good wives or mothers because they're asking these questions. They're actually being better partners because just as easily as you can get divorced, it could be your husband dies. Um, and if you're not aware of what's going on, then you, your entire family is at, at risk. So you do have an obligation. Anything can happen. So that's my, uh, as because <laughs> my know, life is, evidence is that. I mean, I think that uh, that gets to the formation of fiscal feminist and, and obviously of these different issues we're talking about with the your parents and cybersecurity. The initial one of your divorce and where you found yourself in stage of life. And of course, now you have this thriving career, your partner and a managing director here at this firm. And and have found that sort of financial stability, but also financial knowledge, organization, yes. clarity. And you've made it your mission. I don't want to use the expression to give back. First of all, I hate that expression because it isn't true. You give back when you stole something from somebody. <laughs> and I don't think people were stealing from others. But you want to contribute to others in a meaningful way. So it, it occurs to me that the vision of Fiscal Feminist, has, in a weird way, sad as it may be to say, it wouldn't have been able to exist apart from the hardship that you had gone through Correct. in your life. Correct. Well, tell me this. Um, what do you think about the efforts that you see out in the financial community to uh, speak to women, to tailor financial advice to women? I, I could say what's different about what you're doing, but I've already answered that about the autobiographical piece. There's a lot of authenticity, but it seems to me and obviously, my perspective may be a little different, for one thing, because I'm a man, but um, also because I'm so in in the inside of what you're doing right. that I may have a bias towards it. But it seems to me a lot of what other efforts exist out there in outreach to women are marketing-driven and not message-driven. Tell me what how you would compare what you're doing to some of the other things out there. Well, I'm trying to raise consciousness through topics that I think are interesting to women. So I try to do a deep dive into what they should be doing on a certain topic that I address. But one of the things I've been thinking about lately is what is out there for women? And, you know, there are obviously not as many women as advisors as there are men advisors, but there is a growing faction of women advisors that are trying to reach out to women through planning. I think plan it's a, usually a planning-led uh, approach to women, financial planning in some instances. But what I'm a little, what I like to talk to you about is I think there's a lot of confusion when I speak to women of all different wealth levels. They're different, you know, new investors, young women in the professional world, or, you know, women who may not have a million dollars. So they, they have a different level of investing and they just don't know where to begin. So this could be a, a question for all people, mm -hmm. but I think um, for women in particular, again, they're not maybe as um, 
comfortable in just dealing with all this stuff and it might be just a bit overwhelming just because it's not a conversation that we've been having with our parents and so on and so forth uh, Mm -hmm. forever and a day. So I look at, you know, the different options that are out there and, uh, you know, you watch television and you see this E-Trade commercial, which says, you know, don't, I think something like don't get mad, but get E-Trade. So you go on the E-Trade site and it gives you these kind of formulaic questions that you answer. And then from there, you're kind of, you can be put into a certain type of portfolio that pops up at you as to what you are after this five second question that they, you know, questions that they've asked you. And then they, you know, they give you a little talk on what allocation means with lemonade, chocolate, and chocolate chip cookies, mm. hot chocolate. So it's it's trying to teach, mm-hmm. but it's very basic. And I think it's it could also be careless if you're really new to investing and maybe you have fifty to to $100,000 and you've worked really hard to save this. Where do you begin? And in the realm of women, you know, we have Elvest, which is, you know, a great platform in the sense that it is very, very dedicated to women. I'm not sure... It's that much different as a robo advisor from other robo advisors, except for the fact that they try to invest in companies that promote women to management. So that is kind of a thematic thing that they have going on there. And they do have a um, a platform where you can interface with advisors through text and email. And as you go up the ladder in, in investment amount, you can actually speak to somebody at some point. And they do call themselves a fiduciary, which kind of perplexed me a little bit. So I guess that's a long-winded intro, but my question to you is, where do people like that start? You know, once they've got their three months or six months of emergency cash and they want to start saving and they maybe they've already done up their 401k to the max or maybe they don't have the option for a 401k, I don't know. But I think that is a really big question. A lot of people just are like, where do I begin? Well, and and it is an issue um, that you're right is not necessarily gender specific, right? No. Young investors, new investors, someone actually could be into their sixties the first time they have a hundred grand to put to work. That uh, that wouldn't be ideal, but I mean, you see people at different ages have liquidity events where it warrants counsel, and I think that the um, that for let's use your example of a younger professional woman looking to get started. Um, I do believe that it does start with that person's pursuit of someone they trust to be an advisor. And so there are some of those tools that might be out there. You know, some of the stuff I've seen presupposes that a woman investor wants a woman advisor. And we both know that's not always true, but it's not because some women investors necessarily want a male advisor either. I think that there are just plenty of investors that are, I just want a good advisor. Yeah, someone I can trust. And I think that um, there are men who would want a woman, man, just give me a good advisor. Uh, You know, more and more, of course, in the Bonson Group's a great example of this. A lot of times the answer is both, right? Because they are part of a a team that has women in it, has men in it, has in different roles. And and, and they're getting kind of a whole democratized skill set and background and whatnot. But the important thing is that that person has to start with getting counsel from a trusted advisor. Now, the thing that I think is interesting when I look at some of those tools you bring up is that there does seem to me to be a propensity to try to dumb down the investment part of the advice. Yes. And and they used to make fun. Now it is made fun of. It doesn't happen as much because it's actually more mocked that it was sort of like, here's generic asset allocation literature, but it's for women, so we're going to make it pink. Right. Okay. And so and so people made fun of that enough that I don't need to add to it, but it was always sort of condescending and a little stupid. But most of the marketing stuff they did just for everybody was pretty stupid too. <laughs> right. So it, it was what it was. But I think that there is certain issues that you're really focused on that are um, planning oriented around postnuptial, around prenuptial, around habitation, around children around um, estate planning, estate planning, legal, um, and, and, and caring for parents. So there's all these different things that probably are a lot of times the initial thing that force planning and, and, and those types of things that need to get done. But then the investment side is often left to, okay, let's do a little robo. Uh, and, and yeah, there might be some metrics, how they're, how you filter out like where women are being promoted to management and so forth. 
quantitatively, you know, the, I'm, I don't have anything to say about it because I don't know enough about the methodology. But here's what I would say. Um, women are going to want companies to perform well, right? No, and, and, and so I think that they have every right, uh, as any investor does, to high quality investment management. And I think the Bonson Group has seen over and over again, you've been a part of this. There have been plenty of times where I had a meeting with a married couple and the husband was real gung ho talking about this and that. Either he knew a lot or at least thought he knew a lot. And and sometimes the the woman was not as engaged. They start reading the investment stuff that we put out here, our weekly portfolio reports, our dividend cafe. Now they're reading your fiscal feminist. they all this content is coming to them. And they're and they'd be just getting informed through time or getting more uh, enlightened to it. And and I have not found that it is necessary to dumb down the portfolio in any way, shape, or form. I think that they need to, uh, I think that all investors should be introduced to a quality of investment management that uh, presupposes the best for that investment objective. Well, and I agree. So I find that maybe these people, especially like younger people, you know, because I, you know, I do have children in their 20s, late 20s, and some of these uh people within their orbit, you know, they're they're making good money at their age. And so they say, well, you know, just put everything in an index fund. And at 20, 25, 28, that's maybe not so harmful. You still have a long lead time before you're old. But it's also, in my mind, it's, you know, I know people, uh, I know professional women who have done very, very well, and they have all of their money in index funds. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's kind of a scary proposition to me. Um, now, maybe because I have been hanging around with you for a long time. And I really believe in what we do here and, you know, not to make this an advertisement for the Bonson group, but we have almost no client attrition and we have a very thoughtful process and a research or no no regrettable client. No no regrettable. (laughs) But, you know, I think a lot of this algorithmic trading and it's all mathematical. um, And I was reading like, you know, something that was on one of these robo advisors and they were saying, you know, um, it costs less. It offers more than a traditional investment advisor. It takes the one-to-one human element out of the equation, and this leads to more objective and lower-cost investments. Yeah. Well, what? You know, I mean, I don't see. I don't see why that is considered a good thing. Well, it's a, it's a good thing in the sense that if one believes the market never does anything but go up, then um, you 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 don't need a one-on-one relationship because there's never going to be any behavioral challenges, behavioral temptations, panic, emotion. What could be hard about investing if you compound at 10% a year? So so you take some of the silly uh, mathematical assumptions and everyone is all good with it. Of course, the reality is high net worth or new investor, uh, small amount, high amount, you know, three years experience, 30 years experience. The points at which one needs the advisor the most, male or female, are during times of market distress, and so you're you're not going to get a lot of that human element uh, during a difficult period with a computer. Now, the interesting part is they're not denying it; they're just freely admitting it. Yeah, a lot of the a lot of the automation investment automation camp. First of all, it's very largely targeted to very small investors. They right. don't, They're they're well aware most high net worth people um, have no interest at all in a set it and forget it computer driven uh, uh, approach to their investments. They've worked too hard for their money. They care about their money. They're more sophisticated. That's where I think it's really important to the audience that that you've really tapped into that is very receptive to a lot of your content and your ideas is these are bright women. They're sophisticated. They have uh, an adequate amount of assets that indexing would be wholly uh, insufficient to their investment needs. And also, I mean, the fees are not that that low. I mean, they're like they can be up to a yeah, one and a quarter. It can. Percent. It can be, and, and, and that's and I, quite a bit for no one-on-one. Yeah, and it's interesting. If the one-on-one thing is not just not needed, but in that case, that ad uh, it's presented as a hindrance. It's like a negative, and we're we're getting rid of the negative of a human. The well, then why have all these outfits that to come back now and they're offering eight hundred numbers and we're hiring people at a low? You can pay a little extra, like twenty-five extra basis points to talk to some person on the phone twice a year and things like that. So they recognize that uh, people need some degree of that hand-holding in that direction. But what I really have found 
And this is what you, first of all, you know me, and I don't know everyone listening right now. So we're going to, we have to kind of footnote this. I am not afraid of offending people. I could just, it's not That's my, what I my love DNA. about you, David. <laughs> I, I, and so there's always a risk, you know, the conversation. You you could say something politically incorrect. You could say something that's awkwardly worded. I'm not worried about that. I don't care. I, I, I more want to get the intent of what I'm getting at right here. I actually believe that women have an advantage in my experience as investors in terms of just the, the, the personality on this. One thing I'm about to bring up mm-hmm. is that I think men often, not always, there's an ego about like their knowledge of the market, their knowledge of stocks. I know this stuff where a lot of women have do not feel the need to pretend they know things they don't know. And it's not like bragging rights on the golf course with their right. buddies and all that kind of stuff. You know right. what I'm saying? So that lack of a machismo piece is a tremendous asset for an investor. And women are more likely to have that than men. And so then you look to indexing versus individual stock selection, particularly in our orientation we have around dividend growth, the belief in fundamentals. See, what is the number one thing people say against dividend growth? That it fails as an investment? No, people don't say that. No. The number one thing is that my guy at the cocktail party said that his hot dot stock was doing better than your boring dividend growth. It's always an ego-driven criticism. Right. And and I and I don't think you're as likely to see that with uh um uh professional female investor audience. Therefore, it pains me to think that women of means would be parking money in index funds when they have they would actually be uh, inherently really potentially great investors be lacking that sort of ego piece, uh, machismo around individual security selection like we do at the Bonson Group. Uh, well, and I agree. And I think one of the things that troubles me is that you watch tv or you listen to a lot of you know these commercials and everything is made to be this is really simple yeah and this is not simple this is a science you know and you you do have to pay people sometimes for their research and their ability to holistically look at many different aspects of what affects uh your investment returns on all levels so whether it's the U.S. stock market, but there's global, re, you know, there's global problems. There's individual company research that we have to do, and then there are allocation issues about whether you're going to be in, you know, stocks, bonds, cash, or an alternative. Now, a lot of these um, platforms don't allow for alternatives. They don't really speak to those mm-hmm. very much. Um, but again, I think that speaks to the fact that these platforms are built for very small investors. So what should a small investor do, though? Should they be pursuing this or should they be going into um, an advisor, go to Fidelity and get an advisor at Fidelity? Or So this is a gender neutral question. Yeah, gender neutral question. Yeah. What does somebody do who's just at the, you know, maybe they only have 50K. Okay, so the, here's Not a little only, secret. But just here's 50K. the secret that I'm only going to say to you and then whoever happens to be listening <laughs> to our podcast right now. The best thing that a small investor could do who maybe in and of themselves would not get a meeting at a, at a reputable wealth management firm is be related to by friend or, or family <laughs> with someone who is. Because I have a hard time believing that a lot of our competitors don't do the same thing we do, mm-hmm. which is if someone is the nephew of a client of ours, we're obviously going to work with them. And uh, someone's, you know what I'm saying? So generally, if someone is a new investor starting off and they have an amount of money that might not get them prime seating at a larger wealth management firm, but they want the talent and, and abilities and infrastructure of a larger firm. I'm sure that they have a friend, family, coworker who might be able to help introduce them into an outfit like that. But let's say that they really do. And I think it's more age driven than gender driven. Some people just might like those kind of um, technologically driven they don't have to feel insecure at all about how much money it is. They can go kind of start it mm-hmm. off. I think that that's all right if they want to use one of these sort of automated computer-driven tools as long as they understand it's a short-term solution for a longer-term challenge that at some point in time from getting advice on their 401k to actually tying solutions to objectives. Like, what do I need to do with money for this goal here. What yes. do I need to do with this money for this goal here? Defining buckets and then per- adding investment you know, solutions to each individual bucket. 
you just can't do that with an app. It's not going to happen with any customization. So I, 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 the question really amounts to, it depends who those people know and, and also their own personality. I think a control freak who's 25 years old and has like five grand, they're probably just going to want to do their own thing, mm -hmm. build up a little. But once they're actually looking to kind of get in the orbit of getting financial advice, then I think it behooves them to start uh, pursuing what avenues they may have. But you know what's interesting? Even well before they have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to get to work in an investment plan, if they're getting married, they do need to see someone about nuptial planning, yes, pre and post, about around estate planning, around life insurance, uh, buying their first mo home. They might need advice on the right mortgage product. I'm all for digitalization because I will always want the economy to be uh, operating at maximum optimization. Mm -hmm. And there are things that can be done digitally more effectively and cheaper that allow people to then go reinvent, innovate, and produce in other areas. So to the degree that you might be able to find out 10 different mortgage products real quickly on an app, I'm all for it. Can you really get advice? Do they know what your down payment capability is and your credit history and that you might be having to move in three years and that you're buying this condo, but your wife really wants this house closer to her parents. See, a computer can't do all that. I agree. And I think also with respect to women, the thing that they need to think about, which, you know, maybe you can program it in, but, you know, women may have to stop work, may choose to mm. stop working to have children. That's also a financial decision for them. And I think having a, a talk with an advisor or somebody that can show you what that's going to look like to you in numbers, and then you can make a decision about that. You know, how much income will you be giving up? Um, how many 401k contributions will you not make? Mm -hmm. And then if you were to get divorced later, what might that look like? So maybe you, if you don't have a prenup, maybe at that point you do need to have a postnup because you need to incorporate into the fact that you are no longer going to be working and, you know, you're, you're not going to really be getting paid in hard dollars. So in a lot of ways, it's interesting. I could argue, based on what you're saying, that what, the worst part about people advertising the disintermediation of advice from investing is that it's disintermediating advice in non-investment related matters as well. Yes. Because it's taking away that advisor relationship that even apart from the sophistication of investment strategy – they might need to talk about things like what you're bringing up, marriage, planning, career. They also live longer women. And, yeah. you know, so they might. And are, then are we allowed to uh, talk about why that might be? <laughs> See, <laughs> yeah. I will. I will offend people. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be interested to know what you, you have to say on that. But, uh, yeah, no. No, they, everyone knows the answer to that. It's just some people will say it. Some people won't. But it's all right. All right. Well, tell me what it is. <laughs> Hit me. Um, let's move on. <laughs> but, no, but there, I, I will say this, be, uh, the data is not like even disputable. The amount uh, in those cases, which are rare, where the woman predeceases the man and they've been married a long time, the amount of time before the man passes is short, is fractional compared yeah. to how much time a woman might live yeah. after the man predeceases her. You know, a few examples here and there could be outliers, but in this case, the data is overwhelmingly causative and correlated. So what I get when I look at all this stuff, and one of the things I'm, I would like to convey to the audience, my audience, your audience, our audience, is that there is a difference between portfolio management and advisory work. Yeah, there's portfolio management. That's what that's what you're our CIO, yeah. our chief investment officer. Um, you and your team, we are, you know, always thinking about the way to manage our portfolio. But that is one part yeah. of what we are doing here. We spend a lot of time talking to people about all aspects of their lives, things that just come up out of the blue, you know? I even say it this way, Kimberly, it's not even an end. It's a means. Yes. The portfolio management is a means to the end of what we do. And the end is the advice and, and the achievement of financial goals. And a portfolio it plays a huge part in it. But when people try to separate the two or, uh, and, and fail to properly define how portfolio management fits into the broader advice... I think that that's where pretty much all of this stuff falls apart. People do immense damage. So the the advisory work, look, I've said this a lot before. I, I, I don't really think I've ever seen anyone buy a stock that they shouldn't have and sell a stock they shouldn't have and had it devastate their financial life. You could argue there's people with hyper-concentrated positions mm -hmm. and 
margin and leverage and other dumb things they do. But even then, it wasn't the stock that blew them up. It was the decisions around it. Right. But I've seen a lot of people, I mean, financial ruin from inadequate estate planning, trust planning, marital planning, uh, borrowing, balance sheet management, budgeting, cash flow, risk management. Uh, I've seen financial lives saved out of actually doing the proper assessment of their property and casualty insurance. We know of clients Mm -hmm. through fires that they added riders that saved their, where if they hadn't had that, you know what I'm saying? Those things are far superior. They trump the portfolio management. Well, and one other point I want to make is that I think historically, and even now, I was at a cocktail party last Saturday of a client of mine, and there were uh, maybe 100 people there, and there were another four or five clients of mine there. Yeah. And one of the ladies said, uh, one, one of my clients said to this other client, oh, do you know Kim? And she said, yeah, she's my broker. And this is another thing, just quickly, that I'd like you... So I assume that gave you the same visceral response it gives me 20 years oh, later. Oh, my God. Yeah. I hate that word. And yeah. the, the thing is, is that way back when people had stockbrokers, and they recommended individual, like, buy this bond, buy this stock, whatever it was. If you think there's not enough women advisors now, you should have seen how many yeah, women back. brokers there were back in the day. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was practicing law back then, yeah. so yeah, we, we were uh, last rare uh, yeah. pearls there. But so I think the problem is, is that people still hold on to this concept of like yeah. a broker. Yeah. You're just there buying and selling and deciding what stocks and bonds, and you know they the the whole idea of the holistic portfolio and all the nuances that have come into play now. Plus all this, you know, massive trading that goes on behind the scenes that people don't think about, you know, that we know about that affects the markets. And also that this is now way beyond buying and selling stocks as a broker. But that still lingers out there. And people don't get that. Well, I will say this. uh, In a glass is half full or even three quarters full sense. It's so much better than it used to be. It's not even funny. What, What bothers me is that it still lingers but it's sort of a strand of that misinformation that you're referring to. So yeah, that that event, that incident at the cocktail party, I still have that happen too. But it happens every so often, where it used to just every single conversation twenty years ago. The that uh, vernacular takes time yeah. to get sort of purged out of the society, and it takes. And a lot of it is that our competitors are doing such a miserable job at times. Uh, not obviously not all of them. There's great advisory fiduciary firms out there. But there are still people that function as if they're just there to kind of let the client give them an order for a stock and transact in it. And and you and I both are beneficiaries of timing. You know, I entered the business really at the death of the stockbroker model and at the introduction to the advisory, consultative, um, holistic uh, kind of the genesis of the business That's in that sense. So from day one, I, I, the Bonson Group was really built that way. Right. And and I I, I don't know if there's really anything that needs to happen uh, other than more time for it to be, you know, 100 percent clear in the minds, because I do think that there are people that will say that word that actually do know. It's just that it's like a, it's just vocabulary that is sort of stuck in their craw a little bit. Yeah. And I just think, too, when you talk to a lot of people, they're like, well, you know, just going to stick it in an index fund. It'll be fine. And for me, I just think that I worry about people losing a lot of money if there is some sort of Armageddon that no one really understands what allocation truly means because everything's been dumbed down so that it's at the click of a button. And, you know, I I would like it to be accessible to everybody. I'm just trying to tell people don't you know everything you see on tv everything you read on a website it's not quite as simple as that so you need to be a little bit more vigilant and it might be worth finding an advisor through whatever means because i think if you find a good advisor they can really give you some advice about your holistic strategy about all parts of your life because they are all interchanged what happens in your portfolio is going to pretty much affect a lot of other things in your life but if you don't know how those things all work together um, it it could be all for naught. Well, and that's why I think things like Fiscal Feminist and Dividend Cafe and and the consistent amount of content that we create and distribute at the Bonson Group is so important because it is going to be a slow drip of information, of having a point of view, having a worldview. But to your point, 
uh, getting people to develop clarity around where the portfolio fits into planning and what the overall kind of objectives are, uh, that it will take some time. I, I think that the general public is being done a disservice with a lot of the way that this robo stuff or cyber, you know, uh, it, but that, that's not just about true about financial advice. I mean, we're more or yeah. less, we're more or less being told that virtually all these things, there's some things in our life that can be done electronically to save a great deal of time. Like I don't, I, if I get a pizza delivery, I came back from uh, a party on a uh, Saturday night into my apartment in New York city. And um, at the, you know, I've been trying to like really, really eat light and less trying to, you know, get better shape. But at this party, I just had a little salad and a little, you know, I was starving. I've been there for hours. And so, yeah, I didn't call the pizza place and say, let's deliver a pizza. You're on the app and got a pizza there. I wouldn't have even done it if I had to call. It was only <laughs> from the convenience of the app. And by the time I got to my apartment, pizza was there. I only had two slices, had to throw the yeah, rest. Yeah, yeah. I really did. But my point being, there's things like that, that we all agree that technology has made more convenient in our life. But no, the, the idea, and you know who gets this, I think? is our doctors because they have patients that come up and say, Hey doc, I, uh, yeah. The doctor's telling them something. They go, no, no, I looked up on WebMD and it said that, you know, this and this, and they're like, okay, well, um, I'm glad your app went to medical school and, and has seen patients for 30 years. And right. there, there is an appreciation for what can and cannot be done technologically. The full blown holistic, uh, uh, role of advisor and counselor in, in a sophisticated manner, a financial estate, trust, tax, investment, these things uh, will never at any point disinterme disintermediate the human relationship. It will always require uh, both the intellectual and emotional and rational and empathetic faculties of a human being. And the notion that a computer screen will ever or an app will ever be able to do that is something I find utterly hysterical. And in no sense remotely threatening to our business. I agree. And I think what it is threatening to, if it, if people believe that's how it should be, is really to their to their situation, to their bottom line. And I so the my whole mission for today was to highlight that, you know, people put advertisements on television and they, you know, things pop out on your computer, but you know, you kind of get what you pay for, I guess. But things aren't that simple in the world of investing and more importantly, in the world of planning your life out in a holistic way. So be a little bit more thoughtful in the decisions you make about where you're going to put your money that you've worked really, really hard for, whether it's 500,000, 50,000 or 5 million. Um, and that's really my point of all of this is I just want people to be thoughtful before they just plunk their money down and you know, don't really think about it. They just think it's as easy as, you know, I'll pick this commoditized uh, silo, this, this, and that, and I won't think about it. Well, I'm with you 100%. I'm glad you're bringing this up, glad you're uh, generating the awareness that you're bringing up. I'm going to make one final comment, then I'm going to give a little exhortation to you mm -hmm. as we close out about something that it just popped in my mind. But, you know, I think that um, the mission of Fiscal Feminist, if you go back to what we were talking about earlier in the conversation, of awareness and addressing head on some of those issues around financial organization planning so that one doesn't find themselves without an understanding of how their trust is written, how their marriage doc, you know, th those kind of major financial categories of life that you, you ran into and dealt with it. You want people, whether they go through divorce or death to have that degree of awareness, knowledge necessary to, to be financially um, proficient. I think the exact same thing could be extended into the investment side. I don't think every woman or man needs to understand how to evaluate the free cash flow yield of ABC stock. Right. But I think that there is no reason why every investor, male and female, should not know why they own what they own. That that um, their advisor owes it to them to be able to say, hey, here, you own this strategy, here's your allocation, and here's why. And if someone says, well, why do you own this stock? They can say because they get the concept of dividend growth or or whatever the objective or whatever, may you know. be in that case. And and I really do believe that. I've seen it over the years. I'll have people come up to me and say, I never read any of the stuff when we first started. I kind of tuned you out during meetings. And I always just said, yeah, I get that. I'm pretty <laughs> boring. you know." And they said, now I really enjoy reading it or enjoy listening. And I don't think they're complimenting me. I think they're complimenting themselves that they've embraced their own capacity 
for expanding their understanding of this stuff. Right. And knowledge is power. I mean, you feel better if you understand what's going on within the realm of, you know, you don't have to know, like, what an inverted yield curve is. That's why we have... Although now... But you, now you do. Apparently, you listen... apparently your, your cocktail parties, you're going to have the hit of the conversation. <laughs> there, you... there you go. But, you know, I do think you need to you need to get engaged, whether you're a man or a woman. You're not allowed to go on autopilot. And I think, you know, I had a conversation with a young guy the other day, and I just was looking over his 401k selections, and I had Daya Pranas, who uh, is a managing director here, and um, look at it with me. And, you know, he said, yeah, this guy's young, but, you know, he's in the financial services business. Um, his portfolio, what he's chosen for his 401k is, is totally wrong, given his profession, because if there's a market problem, mm -hmm. he's going to be affected as well. So we went back, and I, you know, I changed it and told him this is what you should be doing. And he said, oh, my God, I never even thought about that. And so, you know, and he was the one saying to me, he's one of my daughter's boyfriends. He was the one saying to me, you know, everybody at work. That's you know, one of your daughter's boyfriends, not that one of the many boyfriends of that particular daughter. No, no, okay. the only yeah. boyfriend of that daughter. I, I understand. And, and she, <laughs> she was like, he was like, you know, everyone just, you know, they make so many, much money in the Vanguard and mm. all this. And I'm like, Dude, it's not that simple, okay? I mean, you know, it's not, you know, one stop and shop kind of thing. Bear, bear markets hum humble everybody. For sure. Yeah. Okay, so listen. I have read everything you've put out with Fiscal Feminist. Thank you. And we have talked about the, some of the major subjects, major biographical moments that led and inspired some of it. And I, earlier this year, had a book come out that I wrote last year on the case for dividend growth. My exhortation is you have got to take the stuff that you're writing with the fiscal feminist.com and all, uh, all of these sort of anecdotes and lessons and, and sort of crystallize them together into a full holistic book on the subject. I'm on it. I'm already trying to get my act together to follow in the great footsteps of David Bonson. And I'm also going to plug crisis of responsibility, oh, which was your first book because that book to me was, everyone should read that book. Thank you. We all need to take responsibility for things that we do, including getting involved maybe in mortgages that we shouldn't have yeah. or other things that, you know, happened. And that, that was, you know, the book was about the crash and what David thought was the, you know, some of the contribution, con contributory factors to that. But whether you're a woman or a man, but especially if you're a woman, you really do need to take responsibility for yourself. Yeah. We are not, you know, uh, we're not the little princess. It's not Sleeping Beauty. No. These are really nice fairy tales. But the reality is, is we are in charge of our own destiny. And we can still be good wives and good mothers and madly in love with someone and still be in control of what our finances are and what And our, have that knowledge. Yeah, have, have that knowledge. agency. You'll be a better partner that yeah. way. Well, it's interesting. Crisis of Responsibility was not written with any gender focus at all, obviously. Uh, but it is a message that is very similar to what you're referring to, that responsibility that comes with agency and, and talking to women about the need for them to have that, uh, that role of agency, knowledge, responsibility, and, and creating um, safety uh, for themselves, their families, those that they're responsible for. So uh, I will look forward to your um, future book project where you – crystallize all of these messages out of Fiscal Feminist. And of course, in the meantime, we'll look forward to more Fiscal Feminist contributions at all. Any closing thoughts, Kimberly? No, I'm just very grateful that I have the opportunity to be um, in, th in the Bonson Group, that I was able to find my way financially and professionally um, at a late age. I mean, I had already had a kind of a robust... Not that late, not that yeah, late. Yeah, well, okay. that's true. Well, I had, you know, I had a robust career, so I did have some, you know, resume value, but... Uh, you know, I'm just really thankful. I think God works in strange ways and all the things I've gone through bring you to a point. And my point is I want to help women in any way I can. It's uh, it's really laudable what a lot of women are doing and especially those out there trying to have careers, being wives, being mothers, taking care of their parents. It's a lot. And if I can help one person handle that better, then I am going to feel like a rock star. Well, you've already done that and and then some and many, many more to come. So for those of you listening right now that had not yet previously been familiar with Fiscal Feminist, please check it out. Subscribe for Kimberly's blog and Kimberly's uh, podcast, FiscalFeminist.com. 
And those of you that are frequent fiscal feminist followers and never heard of Dividend Cafe, you're welcome to uh, follow along our investment writing weekly market commentary at DividendCafe.com as well. Please do write a review of Fiscal Feminist blog, rate it uh, on your Apple, you know, iTunes, uh, Stitcher, Google Play, whatever it is. Those things, as maybe obnoxious as they may be, but it takes you five seconds to hit the stars, uh, they help drive the algorithm, speaking of computerization, that uh, affect traffic and affect how uh, that podcast gets out to the world. So the more uh, you know, you're able to kind of help in that cause, the more people will get familiar with Kimberly's message, a fiscal feminist, and the Bonson Group's investment message at Dividend Cafe. Thanks for listening to both of our podcasts. We will see you again.